Welcome to Equilibrium. It's easy to think of chemical reactions as processes that start, finish, and are just over with. An example of this would be something like cooking, which is nothing more than a set of chemical reactions. But let's say we take some ingredients for cooking. We take some eggs and we mix it together with flour and sugar and other ingredients and we bake these at 350 degrees. We're going to get some baked goods out of this, let's say a cake. This particular process is now done. The cake is the final product. And there's no way to uncook the cake and get back the eggs, flour, and sugar. So we say that this process is irreversible. Combustion reactions are another example of a process that's irreversible. If you take a hydrocarbon, say CH4, and we combust it, so we react it with oxygen, we get carbon dioxide and water as products. And this reaction is irreversible as well. There's no way to get the methane and oxygen back from the carbon dioxide and water products. I called both of these processes irreversible, but when we talk about chemical reactions, we sometimes say that they go to completion. So a reaction that's irreversible, we can describe that as going to completion. And that just means that all the reactants are used up to form the maximum amount of product. That said, many reactions are reversible. Let's consider the reaction of A plus B to form products C and D. If C and D can react together to reform A and B, so C and D react together, and they have A and B as the products of that reaction, then this reaction overall, we call this reversible. In fact, this second reaction is called the reverse reaction. And it's literally just the original reaction, or the forward reaction, backwards. The products become the reactants, and the reactants became products. And in the case where A and B can form products C and D, and those products can undergo a reverse reaction to form A and B, we have a much cleaner way of writing it. And we show it like this. A plus B, and then we use a double arrow, a double-headed arrow like that, goes to products C and D. This shows that the reaction can proceed in one direction. The top arrow shows it can go to the right. And the bottom arrow shows that it can go to backwards, or reverse, to the left. So one thing is that this double arrow says that the reaction can happen in both directions. But it goes actually further than that. And the double arrow implies that these reactions are happening at the same time. So the forward reaction of A to B, forming C and D, is happening simultaneously as the reverse reaction of C and D forming A and B. And when we have reactions like this, when the forward and reverse reactions are happening at the same time, the reaction can reach a state of equilibrium. Now, equilibrium can sometimes just generally mean a state of balance. And that's very much the case with this reaction. It's going to be in a state of balance if it's at equilibrium. So how do we know when something's at equilibrium? Well, we say that when something is at equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. So the rate of the forward reaction is equal to, and this is such an important piece, is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. We can use cars driving over a bridge as an analogy of an equilibrium reaction. We know that cars can cross the bridge in either direction, so we can have cars going this way and cars going this way. And if we now consider the rate of cars crossing the bridge, so let's say that 30 cars cross in one direction in a minute, and in the other direction, 30 cars also cross in that minute. So the rate of cars going across this bridge is the same for both directions. Because the rates are the same, we would say that this is in equilibrium. Now there's a second idea that accompanies this first idea of the rates being equal. Well, if the rates being equal is the definition of equilibrium, then this idea is a consequence of that. At equilibrium, the concentrations of reactants and products are constant. Now this is the trickier part for most people to keep straight about equilibrium. The rate part's kind of easy to remember, but a lot of people get tripped up with this idea of reactants and products remaining constant. And the reason is that constant simply means unchanging. It does not mean equal, and it does not mean equivalent. We can extend our original bridge analogy here to see what I mean by this. Here we have two geographic areas connected by a bridge. We have a city over here on the left, and we have a small farm town over here on the right. And let's say that this city has a population 
of 10,000 people. The farm town has a population of 100 people. Now every day, people need to go back and forth between the farm town and the city. And let's say that every hour, 50 people from the city go to the town. So 50 per hour go this way. That's the rate in that direction. And let's say 50 people from the farm town go to the city every hour as well. So we have 50 per hour in this direction as well. Well, what's going to happen to the populations of the city and the farm town every hour? Well, let's look at the farm town. Every hour, we get an additional 50 people. But at the same time, we lose 50 people. So that 100 is going to stay the same. And you can see that the same would happen for the city. Every hour, we gain 50 in this direction. But we also lose 50 people traveling out to the farm town. So you can see that even though every hour people are crossing this bridge and going back and forth, because their rates are the same, there's 50 people in this direction per hour and 50 people in the other direction per hour, so the rates are the same. Because the rates are the same, the concentrations of people in the city, the 10,000 people and the 100 people, are remaining constant. Now because there are still changes occurring, that means people are physically moving back and forth at all times, even though the total amounts remain constant, we call this a dynamic equilibrium. Saying that it is dynamic simply means that there is motion involved. And we say that chemical reactions reach a dynamic equilibrium as well, because the particles are also constantly reacting and moving. There's one more interesting thing we can look at about equilibrium, and that's if we take a reversible reaction between reactants and products, so we'll use a double arrow here to show that it's a reversible reaction, we can say that this reaction will reach equilibrium no matter how many reactants or products we start with. So let's look at two cases here. In the first case, I'm going to start with a very high concentration of reactants, and I'm going to start with no products. So on my graph, the reactants are going to start very high, a very high concentration, and my products are going to start down here at zero. What's going to happen is, as I allow the reaction to proceed, the reactants are going to be used up. They're going to use it quickly at first, and as I run out of reactants, the rate's going to slow and slow and slow until I reach a steady level. Now we can look at the product side of this. What's the change in the amount of product going to look like as the course of the reaction proceeds? Well, at the beginning for the reactants, the reactants were used up very quickly. That means product is going to be formed very quickly. But we can see that the reactant rate dropped off. It was used up less and less. It sort of leveled off. And we're going to see that same leveling off occur for the products. So based on this graph showing the changing concentration of reactants and products, we can see that right about here on the graph is where they reached equilibrium. And we know that because the concentrations of reactants and products became constant. Past this mark, the concentrations are constant. These lines are flat. Now let's look at the second case, where I start off with no reactants, but I start off with a high amount of product, or a high concentration of product. That means this time, my product's going to start all the way up here, and my reactants are going to start at zero. Now in this case, the forward reaction is not going to happen at first, because there are no reactants to do this left to right forward reaction. But I do have a lot of products that could react together and do the reverse reaction, essentially making the reactant molecules. My products are going to be used up quickly at first as they undergo the reverse reaction, but eventually they're going to level off and reach a constant amount. As my products were being used up, they were making more of the reactant side molecules, or what we've labeled as the reactant side molecules. So we're going to see those reactant molecules increase quickly. So the reactant molecules are going to start increasing quickly at first, but they're also going to level out and eventually come to a steady level. As you can see from these two graphs, the amounts that ended up at the end of reactant and product, so we can see the levels of reactant and product at the end of each of these graphs, and we can see that their relationship to each other is the same. There is the same relative amount of reactant molecules and product molecules, or same relative concentrations of those, when equilibrium has been reached. And it is independent of how much we started with. In the first case, I started with lots of reactant side molecules and no product side molecules. In the second case, I had the opposite situation. But no matter what my starting concentrations were, I reached the same equilibrium point. In other words, at equilibrium, I had the same relative amounts of reactants and products. 
And that's one of the really interesting features about reactions at equilibrium. That wraps up our lesson on equilibrium. Write down any questions you have in your notes and bring them with you to class.